So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Center for WTO Studies, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, New Delhi, and the Faculty of Law, Foreign Trade University of Vietnam, it is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our working session on designing development-friendly trade policy for a sustainable future. Uh, I'm Shelja Singh from the Center for WTO Studies and the moderator for this session. I am extremely delighted to be joined by a very distinguished set of panelists. Since we have limited time at our disposal, please permit me to keep the introductions brief. We have with us today, Professor J.P. Singh. He is Professor of International Commerce and Policy at the Shah School of Policy and Govern Governance uh, George Mason University, USA, and also a fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy in Berlin. Dr. Wu Kim Nun is a lecturer in law at the Faculty of Law, Foreign Trade University, Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, we have with us Weiss Paolo Yu, who is a senior legal advisor at the Third World Network, Malaysia. And we have with us RV Anuradha, who is a partner at Claris Law Associates, New Delhi, and heads her firm's practice in international trade and investment law and policy. Needless to add, uh, they are all experts in their respective fields, and I thank them for agreeing to be a part of this panel. Just a housekeeping information for our participants uh, before I proceed further. Please use the ask question a feature if you have any query and time permitting, uh, hopefully we will be able to get to them towards the end of today's session. So moving on, the main objective of today's working session is to discuss and understand the challenges and concerns of the developing countries when it comes to formulation of international trade rules pertaining to sustainable development, and more importantly, to explore what could be a possible way forward on this. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development calls for a shared blueprint and global partnership by all countries, developing and developed, for ensuring a prosperous future for all. There are several sustainable development goals uh, that have a direct bearing on international trade. These pertain to issues raising, uh, ranging from climate change to labor. And as we see currently, we have several proposals having a direct linkage with environment and labor at, on the sidelines or outside of the WTO. These include uh, measures relating to lib uh, proposals relating to liberalization of environmental goods and services, fossil fuel subsidies reform, forced labor, carbon border adjustment mechanism, etc. This also includes the two joint initiatives that we see on trade and environment proposed by certain WTO members dealing with environmental sustainability and plastic pollution. So there are these two crucial issues to note here and that requires assist, uh, assessment by the developing countries. A, it is important to have clarity to what extent some of these proposals will actually be able to meet their stated objectives. For instance, if we take the case of Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism or CBAM, a recent UNCTAD study has found that EU CBAM proposal uh, has very, very limited value in mitigating climate change, as the mechanism would cut only 0.1% uh, of global carbon dioxide emissions. And the second critical issue uh, that needs further deliberation and assessment is that when countries are deciding to join or, or to agree to some of these proposals and provisions, they should be cognizant of the fact uh, that these may in some ways be diminishing the policy options available for tackling the issues uh, at hand, particularly when we are talking about climate change. 
So as we see it, or as I see it, uh, developing countries today find themselves uh, in a precarious position. Uh, their economies have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. They continue to lack the resources and technology needed to meet some of these SDGs. And they are also at a heightened risk uh, when it comes to the effects of climate change. Therefore, it is crucial today that we discuss ideas for sustainable trade policies that can be effectuated effectively by all countries, including developing countries and the least developed countries. With this as the context, let me turn to our panelists uh, of the day and let me start with you, Professor J.P. Singh. I would be grateful uh, if you could cover in your intervention how should developing countries approach the recent trend towards mainstreaming uh, some of these issues on environment and labor at the WTO away from the other international organization or relevant uh, international frameworks? So over to you, Professor J.P. Singh. Professor Shalja Singh, thank you very much. And thank you also to everyone for organizing this panel. And uh, good morning to you from Washington, DC. So what I'm gonna do is uh, make a few uh, big picture comments about uh, GATT, our WTO's record in designing development friendly trade policies in the past, which perhaps can tell us something about how they may be designed for a sustainable future. Uh, I hope that this makes us think a little hard about this track record, which uh, to put it uh, bluntly is not very good. Okay. Uh, neither GATT nor WTO has uh, 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 really had a development agenda. So whenever I think uh, in the context of uh, uh, the way that GATT and WTO rules have evolved, that we begin to think about development uh, uh, friendly policies, one must be a little suspect and one must uh, hearken a bit of history. So I hope you'll allow me to do that just for a couple of minutes. I'm going to talk about three key moments in GATT WTO history, which might instruct us on, on what lies in the future, and then the results of those three key moments, and then the kind of exigencies we have now with respect to environment, uh, labor, and other. Uh, sustainable provisions, and then perhaps touch briefly also on what could possibly be done given this history to ensure a sustainable future. The three key moments I want to talk about, one would be the creation of GATT itself. At that moment, uh, the newly post-colonial or some of them were colonial countries, what did they want? They wanted infant industry protection so that they could diversify. Uh, that was pretty much shunted out of the agenda in Havana or before or even after that. And what instead the developing world, the colonial world got uh, was imperial preferences. Okay? Because at that time, a lot of the colonies depended on their former, or uh, the colonizers depended on their former colonies uh, for those commodities, for those agricultural products. So instead they got imperial preferences. Now, the history of how imperial preferences would evolve into what we now call special and differential treatment is messy. But there seems to be a perceived wisdom as if the developing world wanted that. It's actually a much more complex history, much more complex than, than I could go into very quickly over here. But at the end, what the developing world got through GSP or what the system or special and differential treatment has by one uh, observer been called a favor to the poor or the Indian economist Ian Srinivasan called it crumbs from the rich man's table. The third uh, part that I wanna talk about is how did all of this uh, play out then in uh, uh, provisions that uh, 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 evolved through the Euro go round. What you have over here are just some slides taken and developed from my book, Sweet Talk, where I talk about paternalism from uh, the global North. And you can see that in the Euro go round, all the countries that received development assistance did not receive uh, 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 agricultural trade concessions, despite the so-called heralded agreement on agriculture. The hyperbola there should make us all awaken to the kind of trade-off between paternalism, in this case, operationalizes development assistance versus who gets trade concessions. Uh, this to me are just uh, uh, content analysis of the paternalistic references in all of the press releases from the USDR between 1982 and 1995. 93% of the paternalistic statements that the USTR made were towards the developing world or non-OECD countries. Here is an analysis of 
of uh, agricultural trade concessions at the Uruguay round. And you can see there that uh, foreign aid paternalism and being a former European colony results in negative concessions to the developing world. Similar thing when it comes to uh, manufacturing. Uh, the combined effect of foreign aid given to developing countries and paternalism uh, results in uh, negative concessions to the to to the developing world. So those are the three key moments I wanted to uh, uh, remind us of in the history. Which then I let me point to three results from that. One is STD has uh, produced inefficient producers in the developing world beholden to the so-called charity uh, from from the developed world. That charity may be in the form of foreign aid, which results in no concessions actually. It has to stop diversification in the developing world. So developing countries have been caught in the low ends of the value chain. Three, um, the developed world on top of that has brought in other measures that were thought any kinds of manufactured imports from the developing world. Those could be uh, measures for SPS, for labor standards, intellectual property perhaps be most relevant here. When uh, World Intellectual Property Organization in the 1970s was seen as too friendly towards developing country interests, two things happened. The agenda was moved over to GATT, and two, uh, there was there were all kinds of maneuvers to make the World Intellectual Property Organization more responsive to the Global North's aims in this case. So those are sort of some of the key results here. Let me now speak of three exigencies that are in, in our midst now. One is that of climate change. We are talking about this exigency of climate change when you have these low end commodity producing extractive industry manufacturing work being done in the developing world precisely uh, because of the world system and the way that it has been. So the developing world is caught in this low end work, whereas the developed world can move on perhaps to high end and perhaps energy friendly uh, policies. Um, on the uh, and one thing one might point out is that until recently, um, till for example, we had the Basel Convention on the control of transboundary movement of hazardous wastes, etc. Developing world was also used a, as a dumping ground for toxics and chemicals. Uh, in India's case, perhaps the, the case of the French aircraft carrier Clemenceau is most famous when the Indian Supreme Court did not allow Clemenceau to be dismantled in, in the state of Gujarat. Uh, so when we are talking about this exigency of climate change and what the developing world is doing or has done, keep in mind the trade policies which have kept the developing world in place where uh, and which are responsible for part of the carbon footprint coming from that side of the world. Second exigency today is trade competition from China and also uh, fierce dependence on it in, in the global north. I, I won't go that much into it right now, but that is a very important issue in terms of most of the trade measures being developed in the global north right, right now, and also in, in, in terms of what's coming uh, from, from Geneva. And finally, we have a multilateral trade system that is broke and needs to show that um, it has some type of a legitimacy uh, to be able to del uh, deliver on global trade aims. So those are the three exigencies. Uh, given this history and given these exigencies, uh, let me now propose three measures which would perhaps sound sustainable. Okay? One would be that you would need a graduation strategy for the developing countries, complex agreements that allow for developing world to diversify their exports okay? and a recognition of the history. Second, you would need trade openness and cutting of subsidies in the developed world, which is what the developing world has been asking for a very long time. Okay. So before we move on to an agenda of the future, these are two items from the past that would need to be taken care of uh, to be able to move on. And third, perhaps I want to suggest that the big issue of China in the world trading system may need a settlement outside of the WTO. If every instrument being fashioned within the WTO uh, has in some ways uh, China in, in, in the background, um, then uh, the, the rest of the world is also affected by those measures okay, because of the way that the WTO works. And in this particular case, uh, WTO with its uh, perceived lack of legitimacy in, 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 in at the time that we are in may not be handle, able to handle that, that big an issue. So the developed world in summary, I would say has 75 years of history to overcome since GATT was created and two centuries of colonialism preceding GATT 
in which the policies coming out in the international trading system have not been uh, development friendly. This track record is not good. And since GATT and WTO, it has weaponized everything it could to hurt and exploit the developing world. So we have two scenarios for the future. One would be a sustainable world a scenario in which it would allow developing world to diversify, develop countries to open exports markets, and the world sincerely then begins to address climate change. Another one would be in which environmental policy is weaponized, like intellectual property was, or labor laws have been in the past, et cetera, to further exploit the developing world. Um, so I've brought you up to date with these very background comments, but uh, I know that my colleagues now will go into the specifics of uh, environmental labor measures, et cetera, and the way that a certain amount of forum shifting like it took place with intellectual property is now taking place for other measures. And I will turn it over to them to take it from here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor J.P. Singh, for providing that historical, broad perspective of how things have evolved and where they stand and what should be done in the future. Thank you also for sticking to the time limit. So moving on to our next speaker, Dr. Nunn. Uh, Dr. Nunn, you have been examining the FTA provisions on environment very closely, uh, particularly in Vietnam's context. So can you share with us how these provisions have evolved? And in particular, what are some of the issues that developing countries should take into account if they end up negotiating them? Thank you. Uh, over to you, Dr. Nan. Thank you very much, Saja. And um, good afternoon, everyone from, from uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. And um, firstly, I'm very honored to be part of this panel, uh, this distinguished panel. And um, I'll be sharing my slide before I start my talk. Okay. So for today's section, I would like to discuss about the inclusion of sustainable development provision within the new generation FTA. And I will take very specific examples of the EU Vietnam FTA. Um, mm. If you look at this map, well, what you can see here is that almost all WTO members are members to at least one of the FTA. And if we count it cumulatively, then the number of the RTAs basically increase over years. And these are the um, latest numbers from the RTA information system by the WTO, which show the proliferation of the FTAs. But then the FTA now are not just about tariff or even trade, because simply the free trade agreement has evolved beyond the border of just tariff. It includes and regulates services, competition, regulatory cooperation, or even investment. Some are regulated within a WTO framework, and some are not currently regulated within a WTO framework. At the same time, free trade agreement is not just about trade, because it also includes environmental, sustainable development, human rights, labor rights as well. And we call them new generation FTA, with the um, scope of obligation typically goes beyond uh, the framework or those issues that have been regulated within a WTO at a deeper level and a broader coverage. So at this point, one may be asking, so why are the non-trade issues or sustainable development provisions are incorporated in a trade agreement? Well, um, in fact, there, there have been some of the rationales from both developing and developed countries' point of view that I would like to share with you. In my view, the first reason is because uh, the inclusion of FD, SDPs, as I would call sustainable development provisions for short, a new generation FTA is a response to the deadlock of the multilateral trading system, especially when the trading system is in crisis and members are still in need of uh, engage further into, the, in the, into international trade. So FTA is a suitable instrument for them to include the SDP provisions. And second point is that FTA with the incentive-based approach actually provides a powerful tool for uh, countries to ensure implementation of these non-trade provisions. And um, at the same time, it also provides additional political momentum to engage pa partners of the FTA in further regulatory reforms or discussion. And um, with the members who have been 
uh, members of other international treaties, such as the multilateral environmental agreements, then the new generation FTA will serve as an additional mechanism to police and harden the soft tool for enforcement in these uh, treaties. And from a developed country's point of view, adding SDP in new generation FTA is a way for them to level the playing field for enterprises. And at the same time, they will benefit their own consumer to have uh, and to get better informed uh, decision. For instance, re regarding the origins of the goods or the materials the goods are made of. Uh, more from a developing country's point of view, um, I, will, I will say that the potential economic benefits of the FTA makes it possible for developing country to accept the inclusion of non provisions within new generation FTAs. And at the same time, and the, this point I want to re reiterate, because there has been an impression that these non trip provisions or sustainable development provisions are introduced and uh, imposed from developed countries to developing countries. But then I believe that these non trade values are common and develop our developing countries, regardless of their level of development, are going toward that direction, meaning that going toward the sustainable development goals. So the necessity and goodness of improving this value actually provide incentives for developing countries to commit and follow. And um, one of the reasons from developing countries' point of view is that even though they have signed FTA with SDPs, but these provision mainly remains, um, uh, the approach to this provision remains soft while the language remains hortatory. Um, and in order to illustrate further on this point, I will take a very specific example of the EVFTA uh, to show um, the uh, content regarding sustainable development provisions. Uh, EVFTA is the FTA signed between EU and Vietnam, which has recently entered into force, and it has the chapter 13 of sustainable development. Actually, this is a very typical model of the EU because almost in all of the FTA, in all of the new FTA, let's say, uh, that the EU has signed with partners, usually there is a chapter on sustainable development and uh, the EVFTA is not an exception to that. In terms of the legal enforceability of non provision, um, if the, the text, the legal text of the chapter 13 start with the reiteration of uh, obligation of parties uh, under other international agreements, such as the ILO declaration or the MEAs, uh, stand for the multilateral environmental agreements. And um, in uh, the language of the chapter 13, uh, basically obligation are expressed in a soft and hot actuary language, such as the use of encourage or recognize or shall endeavor appear several times. And at the same time, parties to this EVFTA, EU and Vietnam, can actually establish their own level of domestic protection. Uh, it's just that they do not exercise environmental and social dumping, but they can up to uh, their own um, discretion to establish the level of domestic protection to these non-trade issues. Um, there's not been a common standard established in environment or social area because EVFTA basically reiterate other obligations that member uh, had signed under other international agreement. And one thing is that there is not an indication in terms of sanction for non-compliance. Um, there is a dispute settlement mechanism, no sanction is specifically in indicated. And um, in terms of human rights, which EU consider prerequisite to sustainable development, the EVFTA is generally silent on this issue because EU and Vietnam had signed a framework agreement in 2012. Um, deals extensively with these issues. And uh, also in terms of implementation, um, the use of chapter 13, um, what has a limit in terms of dispute settlement mechanism because uh, chapter 13 um, basically established its own dispute settlement mechanism. And um, therefore the, uh, the dispute settlement, uh, settlement and, um, mechanism under chapter 15 will not be utilized here. And at the same time, implementation remains basically uncertain because no sanction is provided. Uh, why uh, the incentive-based approach may not be as effective as we used to thought about. Um, regardless of all of the soft approach or the hortatory language, still there have been concerns and challenges for Vietnam in the implementation of these provisions. The first one is the need to amend and introduce new laws and regulation. Uh, with the current lack of resources, human funds, domestic legislative enforcement capacity, it remains difficult for Vietnam to 
uh, really amend and introduce laws and regulation in a short time. And at the same time, uh, in terms for labor and environmental issues, there is also a weak institutional framework with overlapping procedures, which means that the transparency obligation will be an obstacle for, for Vietnam to really comply with. And um, uh, the, if the, the first three points that I have mentioned could be somehow tackled by technical assistance from developed countries or engage further in cooperation with developed countries, then the fourth point is harder because it could hardly be, uh, it, it, well, Vietnam or I believe any other developing country will find it hard to really conduct a comprehensive impact assessment of implementing this provision. And it's, it remains a difficulty, it remains a challenge for us uh, to really formulating further trade policy. Um, even though the chapter 13 use a different dispute settlement, settlement mechanism compared to other uh, issues regulated under EVFTA, but still non compliance to the obligation will lead to dispute. And it also will be a concern that Vietnam has to face with in the years to come. At the same time, for enterprises, there will be compliant costs because gradually they will be asked or they will be encouraged to really introduce new technology and uh, use um, uh, better raw materials. So it, it could in, it increase the compliant cost to them. And uh, one of the challenge is because the level of awareness for enterprises, consumer and the whole society regarding the labor and environmental standards. Um, so um, because the limit of time, so I just uh, stop the main discussion there and some of the points I want to uh, uh, I want to, um, in my view, to suggest as a way forward. I believe that the trend to incorporate sustainable development provision with the new generation FTA will continue, partly because um, the multilateral trading system is still in crisis, well, unless there are evidence proving otherwise. Um, I believe in the soft approach uh, where you know, we, we take the soft um, mechanism and the language remains contradictory because I believe that it's a friendly way to uh, really sign uh, an FTA with the non-trade provisions uh, in that. And uh, also, still, uh, I think this, the last point also um, goes from the first point, which is the crisis of the multilateral trading system. And then the FTA uh, sustainable development provision here will serve as a basis for further discussion on negotiation with the WTO as following the bottom-up approach. So with that, um, I want to conclude the, uh, the very short talk about the uh, sustainable development provisions and I'm open for discussion. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nunn, and thanks for providing us the, uh, you know, Vietnam's experience, particularly in the context of EU Vietnam FTA and the environment chapter and suggesting some way forward. Uh, let me now turn to our third speaker of the day, Mr. Weiss Yu. Uh, I would request you to kindly uh, share with us your views on what should be the developing countries' approach to initiatives that, streak, uh, that seek to bring uh, climate issues at the WTO, and uh, what are some of the essential elements in your view that should be taken into account for making sustainable trade policy development friendly? So over to you, Vice. Thank you. Thank you, Shalja, and, and thank you, um, uh, colleagues, for those uh, previous two presentations. Uh, let me just uh, uh, put out my screen and, and, and share it because I think um, what I'm going to be focusing on um, provides us with a good basis for uh, jumping off uh, from uh, what Dr. Singh and, and Dr. Vu uh, pointed out. And I think the, the, the key item that one needs to um, understand when, when talking about the issue of what should be developing countries doing uh, or focusing on in terms of, uh, say, doing an integrated approach to trade and climate change and sustainable development, whether it's in the WTO context or in the, in the, in the climate change uh, multilateral policy context, or even more broadly in terms of the SDGs, is, is the idea really of equity. Uh, it's a, a foundational principle. It's in the WTO, it's in the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention, it's in the Agenda 2030. And I think that idea of equity, the idea that uh, de developing and developed countries, because of their circumstances and the way that they have developed and the, the structural conditions that underlie their development, 
are still essentially different. And one can see this idea being reflected in the 1992 Rio Declaration. You have several principles there that talk about these, and I've tried to list them out here. You see that in the Climate Change Convention. You see that even in the WTO agreement and the subsidiary agreements under the, uh, the, the Marrakesh Agreement. And I think um, that idea of equity uh, is not simply about asking for special privileges or a special, um, you know, what, what Dr. Singh was mentioning, uh, asking for the crumbs that developed countries throw our way. Uh, it's not simply that, but it's really about the idea that, um, that there are certain things as a result of colonization, as a result of, of imperial action, imperialist actions that have taken place uh, at the time when the West uh, were colonizing powers that need to be reflected in today's conditions. Um, in terms of creating a much more equitable and fair world. And that includes, for example, uh, looking at uh, policy space and flexibility for developing countries, whether it's in the context of the WTO or whether it's in the context of climate change, uh, multilateral policy or in the implementation of the SDGs. It also involves looking at what kind of additional obligations or additional actions should developed countries be undertaking in the context of multilateral trade and climate policy so that they help tilt the balance in a way uh, so that developing countries are then given the space, the economic wherewithal, and the, and, and the, um, and the additional resources that would be needed in order to address uh, a structural deficiencies. So what are we looking at when we talk about, uh, for example, initiatives or proposals on trade and environment and climate change uh, that one uh, sees often uh, coming out in the WTO context. For example, the uh, plurilateral environmental goods agreement negotiations that are taking place, the uh, carbon neutrality paper that Japan put out earlier this year, the uh, proposals from the EU and the US and Canada and the G7, G7 on, on um, carbon border adjustment measures. I think when one drills down and then looks at the, say, the underlying economic imperatives that that, um, that, that are reflected in these initiatives, in these proposals. I think there are three things that you know, one can see. One, um, looking long-term into the future, it's really about uh, looking at expanding the market access that developed countries currently have uh, on, with respect to environmental goods and services in developing countries. Second, um, when, when, when these kinds of policy initiatives talk about, for example, domestic regulation, uh, disciplines or talk about um, uh, putting in place uh, certain policy norms that need to be reflected. Um, it in many ways looks at restricting policy space and flexibility for developing countries with respect to these kinds of goods. And then third is then I think um, because the, 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 the way that uh, we are looking at climate change conditions now uh, would really imply that uh, that environmental goods and environmental services would be one of the key uh, economic uh, sectors that will be increasing in the future. It's really about then looking these initiatives, looking at solidifying um, production and export dominance in these kinds of goods and services on the part of developed countries. And one can see this because we we most of these initiatives talk about trade liberalization, uh, commercial uh, terms of trade. Um, talk about the strong enforcement of intellectual property rights. They talk about, uh, and essentially there's a non-implementation of technology transfer commitments there. So I think one of those, uh, one of the, I guess, case examples for that, for example, would be the uh, uh, carbon border adjustment measures that have been put out uh, by the EU. And I think, you know, I just sort of like clustered four main um, issues or concerns that developing countries have, have been mentioning, uh, not just in the WTO, but also in the climate change context with respect to the CVAMs. Uh, one, of course, is that it's hypocritical and incoherent, uh, it's unjust, and in some ways it can be seen as an extraterritorial application of domestic EU policy. Uh, the second uh, cluster of concerns that have been raised with respect to CVAMs is that it creates a carbon-based trade sanctions regime which might, uh, which might actually uh, exacerbate the structural inequalities between developed and developing countries. The third major cluster of concerns that have been raised by developing countries with respect to that is uh, 
uh, concerns about the consistency of CBAMs with, with international law, especially the principle of, of a common but depreciated responsibility, uh, and whether it actually could result in a weakening of, of um, incentives to cooperate uh, under the UNFCCC. And finally, there, there are concerns really about whether those CBAMs are in fact the best policy measures that could be used uh, to address the objectives of, of uh, enhancing action on climate change. Uh, because as, uh, as um, I was pointed out uh, by Shalja earlier, uh, there seem to be no um, empirical uh, data or, or, or clear evidence yet as to whether uh, CBAMs would in fact work as a carbon, uh, carbon control policy measure. So what should we be looking for? I think uh, there will be in the last and then the final points here will be, what should we be looking for instead? One is, I think, based on the principle of equity and looking at how uh, common but differentiated responsibility and special and differential treatment could be, uh, say, operationalized in, the, in, in this new context. One is uh, to really focus on developed countries and challenge developed countries to do more, uh, not the traditional trade liberalization of environmental goods approach, uh, and imposition of CBAMs that in fact do more look within themselves and see what could they do to help develop con developing countries uh, do um, achieve sustainable development pathways. And this could include this. One, uh, developed countries need to do more in terms of reducing their own greenhouse gas emissions. Second, uh, there is nothing that would in fact prevent uh, developed countries from unilaterally, for example, waiving TRIPS enforcement with respect to intellectual property rights over these environment sound technologies. There is nothing that would in fact prevent them from unilaterally declaring that they're not going to pursue any WTO dispute settlement case over domestic uh, climate change related measures that developing countries might put in place. Uh, there is nothing that prevents developed countries from in fact increasing technical assistance and financing to developing countries for sustainable development. Uh, including for technology transfer. Um, and there are other things that could also be done outside of the WTO regime. Uh, for example, increasing climate financing under the climate convention, debt moratoriums and cancellation of debt of developing countries, revising the tax regimes, which could be done uh, through a more uh, robust discussion at the international level and, and, and using their um, uh, voting power in the uh, World Bank or the IMF to, in fact, increase uh, concessional financing and grant financing. And finally, to support the integration of economic diversification into sustainable development strategies. So there are many things that could be done by developed countries, uh, motu propu, um, if they really wanted to help developing countries in uh, fostering sustainable development policies. And so in the context of the WTO per se, I think these are just some of the things that could be looked at. Uh, just to, to summarize, uh, intellectual property flexibilities, of course, is very important, uh, particularly in terms of helping develop endogenous technologies in developing countries, um, special and differential treatment uh, in the context of policy space, um, no trade protectionism, uh, fair treatment for developing country subsidies and a peace clause on dispute settlement. So, Shalja, let me end here. Uh, there's just some of the uh, points that I thought I uh, would be useful for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Weiss, for sharing your very, very useful insights and also suggesting what can be some of the uh, possible forms of future development trade uh, friend, sorry, development friendly trade policy could take. So moving on, last but not the least, let me now turn to you, Anuradha, and we would be grateful if you could share your views on using trade rules to implement labor-related standards either at the WTO or at the FTAs? And uh, what are some of the developmental concerns that have to be taken into account in this context? So over to you, Anu. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Sherida. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for a, a very vibrant session. I can already see the chat box buzzing with a lot of questions and interventions. So I'll try and keep this short and pointed. Uh, to actually just um, you know, compliment and take off from um, what Vice just spoke about, 
in terms of the, the, the various equity related problems in the context of um, uh, core environmental issues and implementation of carbon border adjustment measures and issues such as you know, whether these are really uh, going to achieve the purpose, the, the purpose for which they are uh, claiming to be implemented. There is also another fundamental issue in terms of competence of uh, the WTO as an organization uh, to be able to look at the balance of negotiating positions and structures. So to, to just um, uh, my short point on the CBAM, for, for example, is you know, when you, when you I mean, other than the various arguments that are there on compatibility with that article two, three, and you know, how is it likely to be justified? And those are uh, extremely, um, uh, you know, critical issues. But other than that, there is a fundamental issue of a framework for implementation of climate change related measures, which exists within the UNFCCC. And as of now, the format for implementing those measures is what we call the nationally determined contributions. So key question I just want to leave with the audience is when a country has actually complied with its NDCs, in other words, it is fully compliant with the climate change related obligations under an internationally agreed framework. What is really the role of a CBAM, which actually seeks to uh, you know, claim that the same policies in the EU or in the context of, say, a proposed US carbon tax, the same policy will have to be implemented by the exporters into their country. In other words, it is actually going beyond uh, uh, extending the obligation of a climate change finger. In, this, in the same way, if we were to start looking at the concept of labor and how uh, that interplays, and as you rightly said, Shelda, as of now, the WTO uh, does not deal with labor-related issues, even when we are talking of the trade and uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, structure discussions at the SSB, which is the, which has been proposed. Uh, the focus is really on environment. But as we are all aware, uh, labor-related issues, social concerns are aspects that have been brought up time and again at the WTO. Uh, and a number of free trade agreements that we just mentioned have already incorporated those provisions. But just to summarize, at the WTO, the principle, which was actually uh, crystallized and it came out in the statement um, of, of the Singapore Ministerial Declaration, was a very simple and logical proposition, which is that labor standards shall not be used for protectionist purpose. And secondly, the comparative advantage of countries, particularly low wage developing countries, must in no way be put into question under WTO agreements. Having said that, uh, the, the, as far as FTAs are concerned, there is an increasing incorporation, an increasing explosion of labor related issues. Um, uh, Dr. Wu mentioned the, uh, uh, in her presentation, she was mentioning the fact that many of these, of course, in the context of environment, but um, even in the context of social clauses, uh, the EU agreements that she mentioned, uh, do, do take a softer approach in terms of, um, you know, they are really more in terms of cooperative arrangements, et cetera. And, but at the same time, that's not the entire universe of FTAs. There is a very distinct difference between FTAs that are proposed by the EU and the FTAs that have been uh, proposed and entered into by the United States, for example, which, uh, which seeks to use trade sanctions both for enforcement of labor and environmental related concerns. So the key issue really that arises is, is this covert protectionism? Is this genuinely about labor solidarity? Can economic coercion really find um, any solutions for, um, for example, a violation of a particular labor-related provision? There are a number of economic theories and, again, vast divergences in points of view. There is the view um, of the provenance for the labor and trade linkage, which says that lower labor standards is simply going to lower cost of production and give an unfair advantage to countries with lower standards. And there are opponents who argue, um, based on evidence, that labor standards in trade agreements is actually simply a guise um, of, of a protectionist measure uh, and projecting it as a humanitarian concern. It also talks about the fact that simply introducing labor standards is not going to keep jobs in the developed world. And on the contrary, uh, delinking the two is, uh, is perhaps the only way in which to generate economic prosperity, which automatically will lead to rising of labor standards. Again, similar to you know, the, the manner in which environment has a very specialized international law regime, 
Labour has uh, uh, the, uh, the framework under the uh, rubric of the International Labour Organization, which adopts a very unique tripartite approach, and it focuses immensely on aspects relating to vocational training, on employment policy, on cooperation and um, review of labor-related uh, implementation by various uh, countries, uh, by various members of the ILO. But having whatever the state may be, and I see one of the questions that has been raised in the chat box also pertains to the fact that you know, we, there is really a question of an increasing recognition that unless social concerns are actually dealt with, there is going to be a lot more hostility and opposition to trade agreements. And we do see an increasing reference to environmental labor and sustainable development across FTAs, especially the ones proposed by the EU and the US. The question really, as I mentioned, is whether a trade sanctions approach is the best way to go, or as Dr. Wu mentioned, a softer approach could be something that may be considered. Um, in the interest of leaving uh, a bit of time for uh, further discussions, the, the simple point that I want to emphasize is that uh, the, the, this is not the end of the road uh, as far as these discussions are concerned, but I think it is critical to ensure that if at all these, this, uh, there has to be any room for these discussions, it should be premised on ensuring that trade doesn't become a tool for enforcement of something which is which it is not competent to deal with, namely the non-trade issues. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Adharadha. That was extremely uh, insightful and uh, thanks for covering the labor issues in significant detail. We already have quite a few questions uh, that we have received from our participants. And let me see if I can bunch some of them together for ease of response. So one set of questions uh, really deal with uh, the inequitable nature of global economic arrangements and what really can uh, developing countries do to counter that. And uh, perhaps related to that is the issue that uh, if we have to discuss the interaction of trade and environment, whether it's uh, best to be discussed uh, at the WTO or is it best to uh, limit it to bilateral or regional trade agreements. There is also a question on uh, what are the speaker's views to arguments that proposals on environment and labor are essentially protectionist uh, measures and uh, trade is just about trade. So I will leave uh, to the speakers, whoever wants to go first, please feel free. Can I go first? Yes, please, please. Okay. Um, I would like to address some one of the questions that you that um, the audience raised in the sense that is the WTO the best place, the best forum to tackle the non-trade issues or sustainable development provisions? In my view, and um, I think a part of it I already mentioned during my uh, my presentation before is that the current situation of the WTO study is in crisis. So um, it takes longer time for members to really uh, make something meaningful at the WTO for now. For instance, if we leave the environmental issues and labor issues within WTO, environment, for instance, it's just basically an, an exception. But then if we look at FTA, it has been hardened. These exceptions have been hardened into the rights-based approach. So in my view, currently, then the uh, uh, bilateral or regional agreements will be a better place to address this issue because uh, using the incentive-based approach, developing countries can actually leverage their, their opportunities. And um, I think it makes more sense for them to accept these non-trade provision within that context, regardless of the difficulties and challenges that they may have to face. And also the, uh, the very quick second point is that um, the, Sustainable development provision, even though they have been currently discussing extensively at bilateral and regional agreements, but they will be, they will build up, they will be the basis for further discussion at the WTO following the bottom up approach. So I believe that this is currently um, the, operate, uh, the operating way and um, will be more beneficial for WTO members to start in such a manner. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Nam. 
Uh, Vice, would you like to attempt some of these questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Dr. Wu, for that. I think uh, just following up on what you're saying, I think it's a question, uh, right, in, in terms of, of uh, whether the WTO should take into account uh, how the WTO should look at environment and, and social uh, policy and other things as part of its work. I think it's a question of what exactly do we see the role of the WTO to be in the multilateral governance system? Is it uh, a treaty uber alles? Or is it only one of those you know, treaties within, uh, treaty regimes within its own particular sphere of, con of uh, competence that then need to figure out a way to coexist? With other treaty regimes, like on climate change, on the SDGs, or whatever uh, we might have, or on health, or on labor, and and I would submit that it is, of course, not a treaty over alles, but it is one of those things that, when it does its work, um, maybe one of the things that needs to be done by the WTO is not really look at okay, can we come up with new norms or new policies on on environment or trade or climate change, um, but figure out how trade policy itself can best be approached and be done uh, by WTO members to best help WTO members take into account the other commitments that they might have made in other treaty regimes. So it's not a case of maybe the WTO trying to impose new norms or new, uh, new uh, policy constructs. Uh, on WTO members to force them to take into account those other things, but create a much more maybe enabling environment. You know, it's sad to use that word, but uh, create a much more flexible way of helping developing countries in particular uh, take into account those things and also help developed countries uh, meet some of their obligations that they already have in, 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 in other treaty regimes. Um, I want to also, I think, respond uh, to one of the questions that uh, you that you posted in, in the chat box, uh, Shalja, which is, um, if there is tariff liberalization and environmental goods and services uh, in the WTO, would that actually cause developing countries to switch to imports and buy developed country products? And I think a, a big part of the answer to the question is the fact that when we look at environmental goods and services, um, I, I remember doing a study, but this was about 10 years ago, so I'm not sure how, how um, the data will have already changed. But uh, when I was still at the South Center um, uh, some years ago, the, we, we looked at the export and import data with respect to environmental goods and services. And what we found is that OECD countries were exporters for roughly 85% of environmental goods and services. And that was over a span of 10 years and that did not change much. And when we layer on top of that, the uh, patents with respect, for example, to environmental goods, um, a big predominant part of those patents uh, still were uh, uh, vested in uh, corporations in patent holders that were in developed countries. So I would, uh, so I think based on, I think manufacturing capacity based on uh, terms of trade with respect to these goods, based on, on ownership of intellectual property, I think it would be uh, fairly reasonable to project that if you were to have full on trade liberalization in environmental goods, um, that kind of uh, uh, current dominance in these kinds of goods by developed countries would continue to persist. And I would submit that what we actually need is not that kind of dominance to persist, but actually a much broader based uh, development of environmental goods and services, including in developing countries, so that you are able, uh, developing countries are able to develop endogenous technology capabilities that might perhaps be more appropriate to their national conditions and national circumstances than simply importing uh, technological products from uh, developed countries. And I think that's what we need moving forward rather than uh, than, than this kind of trade liberalization of environmental goods that are being uh, discussed right now at the WTO. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Vice. Uh, Anuradha, would you want to comment on any of the questions? 
Yeah, I thought I would pick the one uh, from her from the uh, FTU Vietnam. And uh, you know, on the issue of uh, you know whether actually including labor-related social clauses may increase uh, better behavior by multinational enterprises and enable states to enforce these those obligations better. And I think it's a it's a fairly uh, you know uh, it's a fairly complex question. It doesn't really have um, an easy yes or no answer. Fundamentally, if we look at it, uh, you know, from the perspective of whether a trade agreement actually is competent to even enforce a labor-related uh, obligation. Again, just picking on the point that I made that labor is, as a, as a factor of manufacturing, as a factor of production, is something which gives a comparative advantage to certain countries over others, and which is why we have the Singapore Declaration, which says that do not undermine the comparative advantage to a labor-related standard. And yet, we have the USMCA, for example, which says that uh, for uh, automobile manufacturing, the minimum wage that should be applicable in Mexico is the US minimum wage, which is 16 USD, which essentially hits right, cuts through right at the comparative advantage that Mexico could potentially have. Now, why did they agree for it? You know, was there, if, if it is, if it is at any agreement at the end of the day is a political bargaining mechanism, whether that has actually led to an improvement in standards in one particular sector as opposed to others, is that the way to go? It essentially raises fairly complex issues. But I think Haas' question is also more in terms of whether this can engender better, better corporate social responsibility. And uh, again, uh, do we really need a trade agreement for enforcing uh, what, we, uh, what we assume to be uh, something which should come fundamentally as a consequence of various other uh, arrangements, agreements, ILOs, interventions, for example. All of you, for, ex uh, for instance, would have heard of the Rana Plaza incidents in uh, Bangladesh a few years back, which led to the um, you know, uh, clamor for labor-related standards. And one of the consequences of that, interestingly, was not an FTA. What was entered into uh, uh, what, between Bangladesh, EU, US, Canada, the ILO, and several uh, stakeholders was what they call the Sustainability Compact under which what they want, what they sought to address for health and safety related issues in the retail uh, manufacturing garment sector in Dhaka. Of course, there are, there are a number of issues critiquing its actual implementations and whether it succeeded at all. Uh, but the question really is, uh, you know, by simply raising the question of uh, implementing a labor standard in one country as the reason why there is unemployment in another country and whether it needs to be enforced or can legitimately be enforced through a trade agreement, in my view, will have severe shortcomings because a trade agreement fundamentally is not concerned about the various balances and social related obligations that necessarily needs to be addressed for a genuine trade uh, labor related uh, welfare uh, agreement. So I do not think that it can actually ensure uh, what uh, has been uh, sought uh, in the question. Thanks a lot, Thanks. Anu. Uh, Professor Singh, I think we have a question for you. How can past wrongs by developed countries be addressed through treaty mechanisms? Well, thank you very much. And this has been a really stimulating discussion. I think as the developed world especially begins to bring in environmental, labor, corporate social responsibility provisions into trade agreements, developing world has every right to be very suspect. In the past, every new issue, every new small little provision, whether it was consensus-based bargaining or SPS or IP, has, hand, uh, has landed up hurting developing country prospects of uh, uh, playing fairly in world trading systems. So as these new measures are being brought in, what I think I've been highlighting and many of my panelists have been highlighting have been that we, that, that, that we need to look at the track record there. And we need to be very mindful of what uh, 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 is being asked for in these agreements. Um, however, here's part of that track record, which is that the developing world has gotten any meaning sessions uh, for, for trade have been through the WTO. That's the flip 
website. Uh, in other words, the developing world fares much worse in bilaterals and FTAs precisely because an EU or US or Japan, et cetera, can impose obligations on the developing world in, in, in bilaterals or FTAs that it cannot do through, through a multilateral system. But now as these rules are being graduated through forum shifting or through finding spaces in FTAs and then um, making them go over to the multilateral system, I think the developing world uh, should be using the kinds of strategies that my colleagues have been pointing out here, which are very legal, very technocratic, very much based in data in order to, um, to, to correct those past inequities. Um, the paternalism that continues from the European Union or from the developed world about how the developing world may not care about uh, the environment or labor etc denies the sort of things that Anuradha was pointing out just now about social responsibilities about poverty about the kinds of things that are going on in the developing world so at best it just sounds very paternalistic especially in a case where developed world remains the prime polluter in the world and as we all know now that argument has been debunked somewhat that it did precisely the sort of things that it's asking the developing world not to do uh, so there is a history as we move into the future, uh, it'll be, it's, it's, it behooves us to remember the history of how the developed world has brought provisions and the circumstances under which the developing world ekes out certain concessions for itself in the multilateral trading system. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Singh, and thanks a lot to all our panelists. We are completing a dot on time uh, session. So thank you once again, and for a very, very insightful and uh, informative session. I think the key takeaway for all of us and particularly those from the developing countries is to be cautious about uh, any of these attempted interlinkages between trade, labor and environment. So with that, let me formally conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shaljas. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Shalja. Thanks.